Hi, I'm Martine Bernard. And I'm Marty Haas. And this is Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books. Once upon a time, Goldilocks, Little Red Riding Hood, and the three pigs all got together to outwit that cunning ninja master, Rumpelstiltskin. Monty, Monty, I promised to help you out with your storytelling, but right. what in the world is all this hodgepodge about? Well, I've read a lot of fairy tales, Martine, but I'm kind of green in the storytelling department, and I figured if I mixed them all together, I'd have a really exciting tale. Well, pay close attention to this show's guest, because they'll be offering some great tips, tools, and techniques to get you really doing some great storytelling. And when parents enjoy reading aloud in storytelling, that helps kids develop a love of wordplay and language. True. I had the pleasure of chatting briefly with Veronica Vera, a student at Wellesley College, whose story-loving, Spanish-speaking family was the key of her success in American school. And now she's studying to become an educator. She is. And then right after Veronica talks with us, we'll learn some wonderful techniques for sharing multilingual stories with Melanie Kerr, the literacy through the arts teacher at the Mattahunt School in Mattapan, Massachusetts. Hey, Martine, how about this? Goldilocks, Little Red Riding Hood, and the Three Pigs all get together and form a rock band. <laughs> Spanish is my first language, and I was read to in Spanish. I was told stories in Spanish, and that helped me understand English a little better by connecting things between the English language as well as the Spanish language. And culturally, I read fairy tales and just amazing stories that my father would tell me. And by connecting them to the English language and the Spanish language back and forth, that helped me understand the English language a lot better. And by the time I was in kindergarten, and preschool and in schools, I was always ahead of my peers because I knew how to read and connect things better than the kids in my class. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Marisol. She lived with her mother in a small town called Aguadilla on the island of Puerto Rico. And if you look at these pictures, these illustrations, you start to see their culture and their food, their clothes, the way the people look, their houses. Yeah, yeah. Every night before she went to sleep, Marisol cuddled up in her mother's arms, and her mother sang her favorite lullaby. It goes like this. Listen first, and then you can do it with me. Do you understand? Duermete, mi niña. Duermete, mi niña. Duermete, mi sol. Duermete, mi sol. Duermete, pedazo. Duermete, pedazo. De mi corazón. De mi corazón. In your program at Mattahunt School, do you like to bring books that have more than one language into the mix? I love to do that. I love to do that because in America, we're a multicultural country, and it gives children a, a way to uh, appreciate their own culture and a way to experience other children's cultures and a way to experience children's cultures from somewhere completely different and take their imagination somewhere else and have empathy and understanding for different parts of the world. Um, folk stories are beautiful that way. And then you get um, to kind of integrate and, and give children pride in who they are. There on the rock, where her earrings were, was sitting a strange little man. His eyes were yellow and his face was green and his vest was purple and his shoes were turned up at the toes. In one hand he carried a great big bag and in the other he carried a stick. Please, sir, Marisol said, May I get my earrings? Parents express a lot of fear in being creative when they read aloud or when they're telling a story. How do you help them get over that initial fear? Um, my experience is that parents uh, forget uh, how much they have, how eager their audience is and that there really is no risk involved. That if you look back into your history, all of us have had children's books that have touched us and what better place to start than something that um, started with you, that you love, and share it, pass it down. Um, which is why we were saying before that we really, that I appreciate folk stories, because it's folks telling stories and sharing um, history with one another. 
But the most important thing I think it is, is that you love the story, so already they're engaged, and then you start to make it come alive because you know it so well. I can't hear you, said the little man. Come a little closer, he said. And she did, and she began to sing. Ready? One, two, three. Duerme te mi niña, duerme te mi... So, remember, the little man threw her into the bag and he tied it up with a big knot. Ahora atrás, said the little man. Now I have you. Wherever I go, I will tell people about my magic sack, my singing sack, and I become famous and rich. And when I say, canta, taquito, canta, you must sing your song or I'll whack you with my stick. Mmm. You also mentioned that you like to combine stories and storytelling. Right. And that you'll mix the two. Right. Tell us how you do that. Well, I'm just realizing that I do do that. And I think it's because I get familiar with a text and all of a sudden I become more involved with the, the text as far as who I am. So if the book is getting excited, my voice raises and I'd like to build the drama because you'll see children reach into you and be excited by whatever it is that you're doing. So then the text, and, and nothing against the author, because they, they started this seed of joy. But I like to, to add into it to create that new experience between me and the child that's listening to the story. All of a sudden, they, they want to bust out of their little seats and start to participate. They're completely encompassed. So you can truly do that by taking a book and knowing it that well. Then you start bringing it off the page. And it just becomes, it, it increases as it goes along between the two of you then. Yeah. It grows like, a, like a, a seed between you. It really does. And the excitement that grows is because it matters to you. And you are really engaged and you're listening to them. They start to just create and start to think critically and start to become um, thinkers and, and um, storytellers themselves. You'll find one of the hardest things with teaching is keeping them on task because they do get so excited and want to relate it to their lives and want to relate it to and hear your stories and hear so-and-so stories. And it becomes a, wait, but we got to get back to the story now. <laughs> but it's wonderful. I mean, and there's a time and a place. And that's the great thing about doing it at home. You don't have, I have 45 minutes a shot with each group. And I have to process and do all these, these things, you know, um, whatever the curriculum is demanding. But when you're at home, you can spend two hours on a book. You know, you can spend 15 minutes and then come back. You can, uh, you know, whatever it is that you know your child needs, you know. Melanie, thank you so much for talking with us. I've loved it. Thank you. I loved spending time with you and talking about it because it's the most important thing that you can do. <laughs> Monty, I thought you were practicing your storytelling. I am, Martine. I'm thinking about being a storyteller. <laughs> While Monty is thinking his way to storytelling, here's Lori Joy with a more practical way to get storytelling started in your family. <laughs> if you listen to your children play, you'll hear plenty of sounds. Ding, 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 ding! And lots of roars and crashes and bangs. Sound effects are an important part of a story. Now go a step further. In our book, Read It Aloud, A Parent's Guide to Sharing Books with Young Children, Monty and I have suggested over 20 win-win word games, non-competitive games that you and your children can play without losing. Some of our storytelling games revolve around our noisy alphabet, words like sloosh and splat that sound like what they mean. It can be a lot of fun for you and your children to discover that furry friends like Chip here can help you start telling your story just by imagining something noisy. When abuela, my grandma, tells me stories, we can fly anywhere. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Ah, uh, Martine, I can't speak French like you or Spanish like Melanie, but I love bilingual children's stories, and this is one of my favorites, Isla, by Arthur Doros and Elisa Clevin. That is so wonderful because it reminds me of my grandmother who lived on La Isla Haiti and the influence she had in my life. Grandparents can be such a great influence in our lives. As I know you found out, talking with our next guest, Mared Alisea Westhort, the director of multicultural programs at Wellesley College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. I understand you had a very important relationship with your grandmother. Can you tell us about that? She used to do storytelling a lot. Um, she 
she didn't used to read books to us, but she just all usually what she do is like if something happened during the day, and so she used the storytelling as saying, I know, let me, let me tell you a story about this little girl and what she did, and then she will say the story, and it's always something like a moral to the story, you know, what she want, what she's supposed to be doing. And uh, so that's how her, her way to, to maybe also discipline us. And without, she was not like, you don't do this or you do that. In Puerto Rico, there's a folk tale. And it's a character, it's a fictitious, obviously, character. And its name is Juan Bobo. And, and this is very, people. yeah, popular folk tale. And um, Juan Bobo, usually it's many ages, you know, depending <laughs> on where. He could be seven years old one day, and the next day he's 14, <laughs> if you're 14. And, um, so basically, um, she will use that character to get us to, you know, to depending on what, what she wants to us to, to know, when, what she wants us to know or to. So if she had just disciplined you, it wouldn't have made that much of a difference. But the fact that you put it in a fable, that's right, kind of structure. Yeah, definitely. Many years ago in old Japan, there lived a farmer and his wife. I caught you reading this time. That's right, folk tales. Japanese. And black American folk tales. There are folk tales in every culture, with fascinating characters and lots of surprises. And magic. <laughs> and if you're looking for some real magic that will jumpstart storytelling in your family, you're going to love our next guests, Eshu Bumpus and Motoko, two international storytellers. Is it okay if the story has a scary wolf in it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Are you Is that sure? okay? It's just a story wolf anyway, right? It's not okay. a real wolf. Well, I'll tell you the story called Little Daughter and the Wolf. This little girl lived in a little cabin right near the edge of the forest. It was just her and her father. Now, she had to always promise her father that she wouldn't go into the forest alone because in the forest there lived a wolf. A wolf. The most important ingredient in a good story is trouble. Just like Esu said, the how to solve the problem, there has to be a problem. Right. And of course, trouble. I mean, children get into trouble sometimes, and that's something that every child can easily relate to. Sure. So some kind of trouble happens, and then how to get out of that trouble. And of course, in a nonviolent way. Um, let's see. So let's see a girl got lost in the forest. And then what's going to happen? Is somebody going to come to rescue her? Or is she going to get out by herself? Or is there going to be some kind of magical um, object or something? There are lots of ways that they can go. But the most important ingredient is trouble. If there is no trouble, it's not a good story. Little daughter was out in the front yard picking flowers, because picking flowers is her favorite thing in the world to do. Her father came to her and said, little daughter, I want you to promise me today that you won't go outside the gate. He said, you see, I have to go on a long trip. I'm going to be gone all day long. I'm afraid if you go outside the gate, you'll be too close to the edge of the forest. And in the forest lives a wolf. One of the good so ways that we, uh, we sometimes do in a workshop is introduction. Sure. That is, in a story, a parent will tell ch a child never to do something. And of course, <laughs> the child is going to go ahead and do that very thing. And then something scary and dangerous happens. So that's a, that's a good way for any parent to get into a story. Three more steps into the forest, she saw another little yellow flower. She took three more steps, and she picked that flower. You think she should have done that? No. no. Then she looked around and saw so many little yellow flowers that she forgot to even count her steps. She just started picking as many as she could and singing her song. Well, she had a handful of little yellow flowers. She had a handful of little blue flowers. She had the sweetest song to sing. She was having a wonderful time. And of course, she was ready to go right back in because she really wasn't supposed to be in the forest alone. And that day, she wasn't even supposed to be outside of her gate. But just then, she heard from right behind her, Little girl! And she looked around, 
and only one step away was the wolf. Whoa. Little girl, I like that song. Sing me that prettiest, sweetest <laughs> song again. And she said, okay. One of the things we hear from parents all the time is, how do you start becoming a storyteller? Where do you start? Some people say, I, I can't do that. It's just not my thing. I'm not a storyteller. How do you tell someone they are a storyteller if they say they aren't? Is there a way? Well, the fact is, you know they are. That everybody tells stories, and people tell stories all day long. Okay, so so getting people to relax and realize that is the first thing I would say. Um, and then the next thing is read, read, read. and read and read. Oh, you interesting. Know? Okay. Because that's where the stories are that you know that you're going to want to tell eventually. Um, it may start with reading stories to the kids at night or whatever. Um, and eventually, what we hope is that you put the book down. You know, there's things you can do in between. Like, for example, read the story that you're going to read tomorrow night, the night before. Read it ahead of time to yourself, so that you don't have to read exactly what it says there in the book when you when the time comes to, to read ah, the story. Tonight. Right. You may decide there's things you want to edit, things you want to change, or something you want to get the story to say that wasn't there originally. So, and that's okay. Why not? Okay. <laughs> okay. It becomes your story then. The storyteller has to care about you. It has to be right there. It I has know. to be responsible for what they say to you. And when you're telling the story to the child, it's that same thing. It's that, it's that connection that's so important. Right. Who would care about the child more than the parent anyway, right? You right. are actually molding the person, building the child's character, all that. There's this... Um, uh, very well-known Japanese folktale called Peach Boy. And it's a very uh, wonderful story about this old couple who found a huge peach. And that the, when they try to cut it, a, a baby boy pops out. And so, he, of course, you know, they take good care of the baby. And the boy grew, grows up to become a, sort of like a warrior. And then he goes off to a, a faraway land to conquer these monsters. But I didn't like that part. Or rather, I didn't want, when I told that story to my son, um, I didn't want him to think that that's what was expected of him, to grow up to be a warrior and go to a faraway land to conquer monsters. I didn't think so. But I really loved the part where the boy popped out of the peach. So what I used to do is I used to tell the, only the first half of the story. <laughs> so that's why I told that story to my son for years and years until he was about seven or eight. When somebody, a friend of mine, came to my house and she brought the book and she read it to him, and he was like, Oh, I never knew that was another part of the story. And I thought that was funny. But by then, I was able to tell him why that was that I cut the second half. I, you know, and I explained to him, and he understood. One of the other things that, that some parents will say, Well, my husband's a good storyteller because he can use voices, and right. I can't do that. Do you have any recommendation for people who want to try and do that? But maybe can't find their own voice or find different voices or what do you recommend? Yeah, you know, it's important to relax. It's important to, uh, I can't stress that enough because I do it all the time, I just relax. Um, you, you got to uh, realize what you already have and what you already know. You've got voices, it's just a matter of letting yourself use those voices, you know. So um, often in, in an assembly at a school, I'll, I'll take a minute to ask people to think about you know, their voice when they're telling a story. And suppose there was a lion in your story and the lion wanted to say, hey, let me in that door. Would the lion say it like this? Hey, let me in that door. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. So now how would the lion say it? Let a, let a few people, oh, yeah, let a few let people tell you how, right. to, you know. Um, so it's just, you know, it's just you play with it. You know, you gotcha. can make games out of anything. And kids love games. Exactly. Right. And that reminds me that another important ingredient when a parent tells a story to a child is participation. So it's not that a parent has to do all the funny voices and right. the gestures and everything, okay. but um, he or she can ask the child to help. So the kid can do the funny voice, like uh, if the lion mm -hmm. roared, then the kid can do the roaring part. So, right. so that it will be, they are I building see. the story together right. instead of the parent performing and the kid just you know, being right. an audience. Oh, okay. So it's a it's, yeah. a, it's a play with right. a bunch of people can participate. It's Absolutely. an interactive thing.
little girl. <laughs> little girl, did you move? No, why would I move? Now, what are parents building? What are they doing when they're telling stories to kids? What is, what's taking place? You're building an appreciation for language, for literature, for communication, okay? All these things are so important. You know, but but we need that foundation of language. You, you know, when statistically, what people will do is they'll say, "Well, how many words do you expect a you know an eleventh grader to have in their vocabulary?" Right. And, and you'll actually get kind of a sad answer when when you look at where things are now compared to say uh, fifty know, years uh, ago, fifty maybe. years ago, right. you know, a couple of generations ago. You know, you'll find that people's vocabularies are decreasing because they're not reading. Okay. True, true. Because they're not writing. And because they're not being uh, careful about how they express themselves. You see. So we're getting things into the language which um, I find is just uh, causing no end of trouble. Things like talk to the hand, oh, whatever. Right. All the attitudes. Those, those kinds of things. They don't really say anything. Right. Okay. Um, but they express something really negative. They express a desire not to communicate, okay? To shut down communication. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And of course, you don't need a vocabulary if your intention is not to communicate. But, <laughs> you <Good point>. know, <laughs> but if you really want to communicate, then you need to build your vocabulary. If you, and, and the more sophisticated your vocabulary is, the more you can talk about, the more depth you can, you know, approach any given issue with and so on. The so more ideas you can plumb and bring forward and So you things. want to develop that. You want to develop that sense of language and and even starting out just playing with language, just having fun with language. Okay? It's you know, it's it's about how you can express yourself. It's about how you can develop your thinking. It's about how you can develop as a person and and yeah. you know, that sense of community and all is tied to communication, your desire to interact with other human beings. Right. Um, right. Aside from the language development, like as you said, um, the parent is really teaching the child what life is. And that is to introduce and have the children grapple with some uh, certain moral issues um, but through the stories. Like, why is it important to listen to your parents? Or why is it important to be honest? or why is friendship important, or uh, how come the cooperation works better than other ways. You know, those kind of things. Of course, you can lecture to your right. children all day long, but they will but then shut, they shut down. And they, they will not hear. listen to you. <laughs> but but stories. through stories, you can communicate uh. these ideas much more effectively. <laughs> well, she sneaked into her gate, and she slammed the gate shut, and the wolf woke up. But there was nothing he could do. And when her father came home that evening, she told him the whole story about the flowers and the wolf and the song. And together, they sang the song. Trebla, trebla, kum kwa kimo. Trebla, trebla, kum kwa kimo. Now let's review the highlights of today's show. Veronica Vera recommends that you share stories in your first language. Melanie Kerr says, read stories from other cultures, remember you have an eager audience, let the stories become part of you, ad lib to create excitement. Mared Alisea Westort says, use stories to guide behavior and use characters as role models. Lori Joy suggests, make up stories around noisy words. And Motoko and Eshu say, introduce trouble, tailor stories to your child's emotional level, Introduce morality through stories. And try it. Everyone is a storyteller. Just relax and let yourself go. Now here's Miriam Marichak's recommended Words That Cook book list. Brought to you by the Cookie Bookie Bears. For children from zero to three, On Mother's Lap by Ann Herbert Scott. Sleep Rhymes Around the World by Jane Yolen. For children from three to six, Epossamundus by Colleen Sally. Tiki Tiki Tembo by Arlene Mosell. For children from six to nine, The Mysterious Tadpole by Stephen Kellogg. Flossie and the Fox by Patricia McKissick. Zomo the Rabbit, a trickster tale from West Africa by Gerald McDermott. And for children from nine to 12, 
King Midas, The Golden Touch by Demi, The Nightingale by Hans Christian Andersen, as retold by Stephen Mitchell, and Sinbad from The Tales of the Thousand and One Nights, illustrated by Ludmila Zeman. For a complete list of books, links, and other great ideas that will help make reading more fun for your kids, go to our website, wordsthatcook.org. Now you've got some new ideas to play with, so go and have some fun with Words That Cook. Parenting with children's books. In, in your, your kitchen. kitchen.